I want you to close your eyes. Yeah, it's a little bit cliche, but just do it. Are they closed? Now, I want you to picture yourself 40 years in the future. What do you see? Maybe you see your grandkids playing around in the yard with their friends without a care in the world. And maybe you see the person you have loved the most right beside you. And maybe you see a house, your house, that you own after paying off the mortgage for 30 years. Maybe you see your children visiting during holidays, bringing their families with them. And you feel so proud to have built a life with such a beautiful partner. Now, open your eyes. Do you know where I'll be in 40 years? A refugee camp. Well, maybe not me exactly, but there will be hundreds of millions of people like me, people from the global south, that will end up there because of climate change. I mean, you might be too, by the way, if you live below this line. Now, let me ask you something. If tomorrow your government decides to tax me 200%, would you be angry? What about if they increase gas tax by 1000%? If you live in a house, what if tomorrow the government moves you to a cramped apartment somewhere closer to the city? What if they take your car and tell you to use public transportation system? What if they force you to take a pay cut while goods are getting more expensive? I mean, you wouldn't be able to afford expensive phones or nice clothes or cool gadgets anymore. But you'd still have nutritious food, you still have your job, and you still have your friends and families. Would you resent the people that make you give up this meager luxury? Now, if I tell you, you need to do this to save billions of people, would you do it? Probably not, right? You're probably thinking, that's way too extreme. We won't have to give up that much to fix climate change, right? Well, I hate to be that guy, but you might have to, because we're getting closer to... Before I begin, I'm going to ask climate change deniers to fuck right off. Seriously, close this video, fuck off, then I don't know, jerk off to Charles Koch or something. I'm not gonna debate you, because climate change is happening, and at this point, there's nothing I can say to change your mind. Second, what I'm about to say may seem like alarmist fear-mongering nonsense, but I'm just describing what experts in their fields are saying about climate change, with sources in the description. Now, these experts might be wrong, and I hope they are because it's just plain hopeless otherwise. But I think it's important to listen to what they have to say. Okay, so climate change is indeed happening. The globe is already warming by 1 degree Celsius, and it's already causing so many problems. From coral reefs dying at an alarming rate, to mass extinctions of plants and animals, to droughts and hurricanes, it's happening now, and it will get worse. It's like the world is currently a runaway train, and instead of pumping the brakes, the conductor is getting high on coke while telling the passengers, we're all good, don't worry about it. Nobody is willing to take the necessary steps to stop this goddamn train, and those who are the least responsible will suffer the most from it. Our current capitalist model is just not able to deal with this problem. And unless some miraculous breakthrough is made, like really miraculous, not only scientifically, but also economically, then we're screwed. But let's rewind. We really need to look around and ask ourselves... So in the 1980s, Western countries caught neoliberalism up their butts. Starting with Reagan and Thatcher, Western countries, with the help of IMF and the World Bank, were able to spread that shit to other countries, like the goddamn plague. You might ask, what is neoliberalism? It's... well, it's an idea. People who champion it think it's the best thing since tummy rubs because it's the only economic system that works or some such bullshit. But in reality, it's nothing but another ideology. One that supports deregulation, privatization, cutting taxes, austerity, and low barriers for global trade. Now, I can go off on how this shit has made life worse for billions of people, but for now, let's just focus on deregulation. See, there's this thing called regulatory capture. I'm really lazy, so I'm just gonna copy this from Wikipedia. Regulatory capture is a form of government failure which occurs when a regulatory agency created to act in the public interest instead advances the commercial or political concern of special interest groups that dominate the industry or sector it is charged with regulating. And this literally has happened everywhere. With growing political capital, 
mega corporations were able to install their representatives to lead regulatory agencies all over the world. Then, IMF shoved debts down everyone's throats in the global south, forcing us to comply to whatever terms they laid out, which usually included environmental deregulations. And so, with regulatory agencies under their command, companies can emit as much greenhouse gases as they want. And as one article from Energy Policy puts it, environmental regulations, like carbon prices, make the cost of compliance visible and impose this cost disproportionately on a limited group of articulate and politically influential emitters, while spreading out the benefit, that is the incremental mitigation of climate change, among many diffuse and poorly organized constituents. This makes carbon pricing a textbook example of policy susceptible to regulatory capture and the general failure of collective action in the common interest. Okay, so that's deregulation. Another aspect of neoliberalism is lowering government spending as much as possible. This means cutting welfare and infrastructure spending, along with other government programs. They might even privatize infrastructure that was supposed to benefit the public, like highways, railways, and power plants. And after 30 years of this shit, governments all over the world has become allergic to spending any money at all to improve people's livelihood. Problem is, as we'll see later on, massive government spending is absolutely necessary to fix climate change. But by the 90s, the economy was booming. And as energy demand skyrocketed and fossil fuels became the backbone of the world's growing economy, CO2 concentrations increased substantially. And with a strong economy, some neoliberals even claimed they had solved poverty. Isn't that nice? Side note, that's actually sort of wrong. When people like Bill Gates says that extreme poverty has fallen in the past 30 years, he's technically not lying, but it's not the complete picture. If we define extreme poverty as making less than $1.90 a day, then yeah, sure, poverty has decreased substantially. But $1.90 is big arbitrarily. I mean, $1.90 is really shit everywhere you go, so it's not a really good benchmark for poverty. A better one would be $7.40, which is high enough that people making that much money per day can escape malnutrition. And wouldn't you know it? If we define poverty that way, the total number of people in poverty has actually increased in the past 30 years if you exclude China, which didn't get infected with neoliberalism. So that's how we got here. The next question is... There are currently 7.5 billion living, breathing people on Earth right now. We, as a whole, emit about 36 billion tons of CO2 every year. And it doesn't look like we're going to stop anytime soon. Literally everything emits CO2. Your morning commute, fucking around on Reddit at work all day, checking your phone every 10 seconds to see if some jackass replied to your shit post on Twitter, your phone, the shipping of the phone, computers, cows, plastics, your mom, your dad, and their fuck buddies, economic growth, guns, tanks, bombs, aircraft carriers, wars, and even this goddamn video. And we just keep on consuming more and more shit every year. So consequently, the world is now about 1 degree Celsius warmer than it was during the Industrial Revolution. The problem is, if we want to keep the warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100, we can only emit about 500 billion tons of CO2 for the rest of human existence. So if CO2 emissions don't grow in the next couple of decades, which it will, we have about 12 to 16 years to completely stop emitting CO2, which ain't gonna happen under capitalism, but we'll get to that later. So surely, after all of this, world leaders have good policies to fight climate change, right? Yeah, no. As IPCC 2018 itself puts it, pathways reflecting these ambitions, that is, Paris Agreement, would not limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, even if supplemented by very challenging increases in the scale and ambition of emissions reduction after 2030. So basically, even if we follow the Paris Agreement and drastically cut our emissions after 2030, the world will still warm up by more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. But it's actually worse than that, because not everyone is serious about the Paris Agreement. Oh, by the way, about half of all CO2 emissions are produced by about 750 million people. This is really, really important. So let's put a pin in that. Okay, all of this looks bad, but some jackass in the back might ask, So this is the part where it gets really depressing, especially for me. I'm pretty sure you all know about the floods, droughts, mass migrations, the spread of malaria, extinctions, crop yield reductions, hurricanes and typhoons on steroids, and sea level rise. I hope I don't have to tell you those things will be severe if we hit 2 to 3 degrees Celsius. But let me give you a few examples with concrete numbers that scientists are at least moderately confident will happen if we hit those numbers. 
Severe reductions in water resources for 14% of world's population, or about 1.2 billion people by 2100 at 2.7 degrees Celsius. 197 to 623 million more people in urban areas will be exposed to drought, and 32 to 79 million more people will be exposed to floods at 2 degrees Celsius than at 1.5 degrees Celsius. 150 million people will be exposed to protein deficiency at lower latitudes at 2 degrees Celsius. Global food prices will increase by 3 to 84 percent by 2050. One third per capita decline in crop productions for Southeast Asia at 2 degrees Celsius. Oh hey, that's where I live. You know what's awesome? Knowing you might die of starvation in the future. That's not terrifying at all. 97 to 179 million people displaced by 2050 because of sea level rise at 2 degrees Celsius. And finally, for every half degree of warming, societies will see between a 10 and 20 percent increase in the likelihood of armed conflict. Great, more war. This is what we need when the world is burning down. And remember, this is what scientists project will happen if we hit 2 to 3 degrees Celsius. And right now, we are heading towards 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. Oh, and those climate disasters? They will disproportionately affect poorer regions, especially in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, Central and South America, and the Middle East. You know, developing regions, regions that were colonized by Western countries for centuries, regions where debt was shoved down our throats by the IMF, regions that will have to carry most of the burdens of climate change even though we're the least responsible for it. And these disasters will actually be good for corporations under neoliberalism, at least up to a certain point. As Daniel Faber puts it, climate change itself is becoming a means of social control by capital. For those unable to support themselves on the land due to environmental degradation and climate change, many migrate to the cities to live in the vast ghettos surrounding the major cities, hoping to find work as cheap wage laborers in the burgeoning factories producing cheap consumer goods for capital to export on the world market. In this sense, social and ecological impoverishment of the popular classes, exacerbated by climate change, is advantageous for both domestic and transnational capital, as it functions to create a vast supply of cheap labor for the agricultural plantations, mining and logging operations, and manufacturing facilities producing shoes, electronics, toys, clothing, and countless other commodities for the world export. Our wages will be driven further down while all the profits go to the wealthiest people on earth, and they are the ones who should bear the responsibility for climate change. Oh yeah, remember that 750 million people figure? That's the world's top 10% wealthiest people, and as I said, they emit half of all CO2 emissions. We will suffer because these goddamn people sell up so much goddamn oil for their goddamn bullshit. And they don't have to care. They have enough money to pack up and move somewhere else if sea level rises and drowns poor people. When there's food shortages, who do you think will be able to afford and hoard food? And with the world in chaos due to famines, water conflicts, droughts, floods, typhoons, and malaria, Climate refugees will have to move to more hospitable regions in higher latitudes, regions that are more developed and will have enough resources to build climate mitigation and adaptation projects. So when hundreds of millions of people start their journey northward, and with millions of hands knocking on their door, how do you think those countries will react? Do you think the refugees are going to be welcomed with open arms? Shit, I'm willing to bet some countries will even elect fear-mongering fascists who promise bombing refugee caravans because something something security. Of course, that's only true if the world's economy doesn't collapse. Three dudes from some expensive-ass universities projected a 12% chance of world's total GDP shrinking by more than 50% by 2100, with negative growth from 2020 onwards. To put it in perspective, the 2008 crisis led to a one-time shock of 6% reduction in world's GDP. So 50% reduction is catastrophic, to say the least. Oh, and the most likely scenario? About 25% reduction by 2100, also with an indefinite negative growth, which is also catastrophic. But guess what? It can be so, so much worse. Scientists aren't sure if methane trap under permafrost will be released, because methane is a greenhouse gas 20 times more potent than CO2. If the permafrost melts and releases all of the methane into the atmosphere, our current civilization just ends, plain and simple. Another study shows that increasing Earth's CO2 concentration over 1200 parts per million will cause stratocumulus clouds to scatter, decreasing albedo, and cover less of the Earth's surface. If that happens, the Earth's temperature will warm up by 12 degrees Celsius, which will also end our current civilization. And if we keep doing what we're doing right now, it will eventually get there.
For the globe to be no warmer than 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100, we need to reduce our CO2 emissions to zero by 2040 or 2055. Let's take a look at why our current policies make it nigh on impossible for us to hit that target. Right now, there are still trillions of dollars worth of fossil fuels still waiting beneath the earth for companies to dig up. If we burn them all, we'd be releasing 2,795 gigatons of CO2. That's more than five times our CO2 budget and represents trillions and trillions of dollars of revenue for fossil fuel companies. If we were to survive the next 100 years, we can't let them dig it up. Countries like Saudi Arabia will need to transition from oil export to something else. All coal mines will need to be shut down and people will lose their jobs. We've already seen this before in West Virginia and other coal mining states in the US and it wasn't pretty. And that's just coal. We need to shrink the whole fossil fuel industry, which will inevitably lead to massive job loss. This, this is what policymakers around the world are betting on. It's their magic bullet. They're hoping that some sort of carbon capture technology will reduce our emissions and keep global warming in check. Now, there are a couple of different techniques referred to as carbon capture. The first one is carbon capture and storage, or CCS. CCS is the sequestration of carbon emitted by coal or natural gas power plants and use them for other purposes. Now, that sounds all well and good, but the problem is, out of 21 current and future CCS projects, only 5 don't use the CO2 to pump out more oil. Most CCS pump CO2 generated by the power plant into an oil well for something called enhanced oil recovery, which is basically just using CO2 to increase oil production. CCS can only be profitable this way. Injecting carbon back into the earth without getting anything back is not going to be profitable, so it's viable only if it's subsidized, and it's still currently pretty expensive. The second method is direct air capture, or DAC. DAC sucks air and turns CO2 into hydrocarbons. However, because converting CO2 into hydrocarbons is energy intensive, DACs can only be viable if oil production is zero and clean energy is cheaper than it is today, or heavily subsidized. As long as oil production is above zero, literally the laws of thermodynamics dictate that DACs will be more expensive because converting CO2 to hydrocarbon will always be more energy intensive than digging out oil. The third one is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECs. BECs is like regular carbon capture, but instead of coal and natural gas, they use biofuel, like ethanol from corn or other organic wastes. And again, this sounds like a very good idea, but there are two problems with this. First, like CCS, it will always be unprofitable for companies to pump CO2 into the ground without using it for enhanced oil recovery. And second, the amount of land needed to suck up 10 billion tons of CO2, or about one quarter of the world's annual emissions, is 350 million hectares, or about 10% larger than India. To get that much land, we would have to either clear forest, which will make climate change worse, or convert land currently used to grow crops, which can lead to food shortages. So, none of the current carbon capture methods are viable under neoliberal model. They're either unprofitable, which means governments would need to invest in them, making climate change worse, or going to starve millions. We can move fossil fuel subsidies into carbon capture projects, but no politician will have the balls to do it. And they're still putting all of their hopes in carbon capture projects, mostly because they believe the free market will come up with a magical solution that will both suck up CO2 and be profitable. Essentially, it takes just one jackass to derail the whole thing. If, for example, all but one countries massively increase their carbon tax and there's still oil to be tapped, demand for oil will fall and so will its price. That one country that doesn't have carbon tax can then buy oil for really cheap and will be able to keep chugging the black gold. And because they have access to cheap energy supply, they will be able to outcompete other countries, making it more difficult for those other countries to justify their own carbon tax. So unless the whole world suddenly agrees to use sanctions for environmental crime, and I'll be made god emperor of the universe before that happens, just one jackass leader can really end the world. The most bestest option we have is nuclear. Clear and simple. Nuclear power plants produce on median 12 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour over its lifetime while our cleanest fossil fuel, natural gas, produces 490 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. 
if my sketchy and extremely rough calculations are correct, which, let's face it, probably not. This means we can quadruple our power supply while releasing 90% less CO2 if the world switches to nuclear. Nuclear is cleaner than solar, hydropower, and geothermal, and only marginally worse than wind. I mean, look at this graph. We can decarbonize our power grid completely by 2045 if we follow France's nuclear policy. So why aren't we building more nuclear power plants? The first is neoliberalism. Nuclear power plants are too expensive for private investors and can only be built when governments are willing to take the loss if they become unprofitable. So when the neoliberal plague started in Western countries, governments became allergic to spending money. As one astute observer noted, the crash in plant construction coincides almost exactly with the rise of neoliberalism, slashing tax rates, cutting back the state, and ceasing to underwrite large infrastructure projects of any kind with government cash, which nuclear power needs. The second reason is, well, the public are simply against it. According to Gallup, 54% of Americans oppose nuclear power. This is made worse by environmental organizations like Greenpeace, who spread anti-nuclear propaganda to... Actually, I don't know why they're doing it. And sadly, they're winning. Governments all over the world are closing down nuclear power plants for left and right. For example, Vermont closed a nuclear power plant while at the same time increased the share of renewables for its grid. But you know what happened? CO2 emissions increased by 16.3% since 2005. The same thing happened in Germany and California after they closed their nuclear power plants. It is important to note, however, that switching to nuclear will only replace CO2 emissions from the electric grid, which accounts for a quarter of all CO2 emissions. I mean, it would be a great start, but it's absolutely not enough to just switch to nuclear and be done with it. We would also need to ramp up the price of carbon. Speaking of which... Right now, the main tools used by policymakers to combat climate change are carbon tax and cap and trade. Now, don't get me wrong, those are absolutely necessary to fight climate change, but the current implementation is really shit. For example, Sweden implemented gas tax in 1991 that mirrors carbon tax with a rate as high as $140 per ton of CO2 by 2015. Do you know how much road transportation emissions decreased by 2015? 4%. And carbon tax are currently much, much lower everywhere else. It's $24 per ton of CO2 in the UK, $25 in France, $22 in Ireland, $0.28 in China, $3 in Japan, etc, etc. Side note, it would be wrong for me to not mention the fact that Sweden, as a whole, has actually reduced their carbon emissions substantially since 1990, with strong GDP growth to boot. But it has less to do with gas tax and more to do with the fact that they produce clean electricity. They do this by using, you wanna guess? Nuclear, and also hydro, which at this point are the only low emission power sources that have been proven to work, but those are really expensive to build and governments just don't wanna spend money anymore, so, you know. The second thing, cap and trade, is a scheme where businesses are only allowed to emit some amount of CO2 but can purchase carbon credit from other companies to increase their emissions. This sounds pretty good, right? Except, usually the government set the CO2 allowance way too high to be meaningful. If we take a look at EU emission trading system, while since 2007 their emissions have gone down, it has only gone down 3% since 2014, which averages to about 1.01% between 2014 and 2017, and this is just woefully inadequate. So, the problem is clear. Carbon prices are just way, way too low. But here's the thing, high carbon pricing necessary to combat climate change will screw poor people the most if not done in conjunction with other policies. Increasing the price of carbon will also increase the price of literally everything else. But if the tax from carbon pricing is given to the people, then it wouldn't reduce consumption and it will dampen the CO2 reduction. It is absolutely not enough to just raise carbon tax. We would also need to restructure our society so that high prices won't lower standards of living, while at the same time reduce consumption. This. This is why I think we're screwed. If you live in Japan, Europe, or North America, are you willing to not only reduce your consumption but also take a pay cut? See, here's the thing. To limit warming under 2 degrees Celsius, rich nations need to reduce their carbon emissions by 8-10% to 10 per year, 
and climate economists suggest that emission reduction greater than 3 to 4% per year is incompatible with growing economy. Other nations will hit our emissions peak by 2025 and will have to reduce emissions by 7% per year. Then it will be our turn to reduce consumption and take a pay cut. But if rich nations don't cut their emissions enough, well, why would the rest of the world do it? Now, it has been six years since that study came out. Do you want to guess if anyone was willing to stall economic growth at all? Did you guess no one? Well, you're right. Since capitalism is driven by growth, this economic model is unthinkable for many people. So the choice is either slowly stop economic growth or a severe economic contraction by 2100. And because we're apes with meat brains instead of galaxy brains, we're choosing the worst option. But is it even possible to stop economic growth without lowering standards of living? I mean, I don't know, but maybe? I mean, this is speculation on my part, but given that most wealth is accumulated at the top and most of the economic growth goes to the wealthiest people anyway, I think jacking all their shit to build clean energy infrastructure might be a good idea, or at least, you know, worth considering. But there's always a chance that it won't be enough, and if it's not, then we all have to suffer together. I mean, maybe we should walk more? It's healthier and better for all of us. Or maybe use public transportation system if it's too far or something. I mean, do we really need to buy clothes once a month? Maybe we shouldn't get a new phone every year, and being a vegan is great and all, but vegetarians are cool too. Like, do we really need coffee? Can't we all just do meth like sophisticated aristocrats? If all of us lower our consumption slowly, year by year, while teaching the next generations to do the same, I think we can save the world. Is something I would say if I was less cynical. While deep down, there's a part of me that believes that can happen, telling 1.2 billion people to reduce their consumption is just not realistic. It has to be a top-down structural transformation. So, is there a way, any way, we can prevent this catastrophic future? To be honest, no, probably not. Well, maybe. I don't know. I'm just some asshole on the internet. But unless our political system change, this future will come knocking at our door before we even know it. It requires the restructuring of our society, rethinking how goods are distributed, redesigning our cities to be more efficient, Nuclear power plants will need to be built quickly without sacrificing safety. Fossil fuel prices will need to reflect the external cost, the real cost of environmental damage, without lowering standards of living across the world. Livestock industry will have to be much smaller, replaced with plant-based diet without clearing more forests. We will need to educate girls in the global south even more, which is still the best way to lower birth rate and control population growth. Gasoline cars will need to be phased out and be replaced with robust public transportation system, and so, so much more. Essentially, we need to switch to an economic system without growth, or at least slow and sustainable growth, which is not compatible with the current incarnation of capitalism. And I'm not sure if we have the political will to do such a massive transition, especially against entrenched trillion dollar mega corporations that's trying to hold all of the power. We can dismantle fossil fuel companies, expropriate all of their assets, and use that money to build as many nuclear power plants as possible all over the world. Then we expropriate literally all cars everywhere, build electric buses and trains with the scrap, and invest in public transportation infrastructure also all over the world. Build vertical farms in cities, ban eating meat, reforest the rest of the world, and bury all livestock deep underground. Build nuclear powered ships and ban all planes. Build transcontinental railroad in all of Asia, all of America, all of Africa, and all of Europe. Automate manufacturing, automate farming, automate everything. We can even send billionaires to Mars if they want to build their own Randian utopia there. We can keep partying and pray the goddamn free market will solve it magically. Somehow. Wow, you get this far. Thanks for watching. This is the very first video I've ever made, so it's probably shit, and I apologize for that. Now, everything may seem hopeless, and it kinda is for a lot of people, but maybe not for you. There's this website called drawdown.org where you can see what can be done and how much CO2 can be reduced. It's pretty neat, and they seem to know what they're talking about. If you live in a country with a significant CO2 emissions, 
vote for politicians that support those policies and tell them nuclear is good, actually. I mean, we're not going to get close to even 2 degrees Celsius, but you know what? At least try or something. Or, you know, start a revolution and overthrow capitalism and all that. That would be better. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah. Follow me on Twitter. And the next video is gonna be about automation. So that'll be fun.